This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Boop. Hello, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. <laughs> Come on, that's how you do it. I have a knife in my pocket. Well, I have a knife right here. <laughs> I'm Shannon Morse. Welcome to this week's episode of Hack 5. Oh, we're keeping this cake. We take this show very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> this is the show where you can go to trust your technologist. Wait, what do we say every week? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we're making tech misbehave? I'm not really sure. We have epic, awesome stuff going on, and I'm, I'm enthused. This is, we're shooting out of order because this is, the last chance I'm going to be here before heading over to the Hack Across Europe. If you haven't already signed up and you're in the European economic area or whatever you guys call it now, uh, hit up hackacrosseurope.com. See how you can come out to some of the meetups. I know we will be in Berlin, Amsterdam, Dublin, London. We'll see if we can make it anywhere else. All of the places? So just the places. We'll cool. see what happens. That sounds super fun. Uh -huh. Are you going to see Seb? Yes. Oh, and Seb yay. will be my spotter for the droning which we'll talk about a little later. Ooh, okay. Yes. Well, speaking of fans and our awesome viewers, we got a gift from a fan. Yes, we did. I am <laughs> very excited about this. We have no, I have little idea, but we have not seen what's in this I don't box. I know what it is. Um, and but, here we go. I got a knife right here in our new Tactical Elite bag, huh? He's talking oh, about you guys. Oh, Molly Strap, huh? I, I love have Mealy Kershaw's. Myself. These guys are the best. The Onion Leak, I want to say? Yes, it's the Ken Onion design. It's called the leak. Mine is better. Is, what are you talking about? Mine have teeth. S yeah, I don't, we don't need teeth. It's a You, you always open, need teeth. But it's tape. It's packing tape. I don't care. I use this to open up letters and okay, stuff. Okay, fine. Well, we'll see whose knife is me. Okay. Um, so this right here is an awesome uh, design by our friend, by Andreas. And you can find his stuff oh, on his Oh, look at that. Twitter, I opened is, it. So easy. Totally not having trouble <laughs> on my end. Uh, yeah, by Andreas on Twitter, and you can find his website by Andreas.com. He's got some ridiculously awesome designs. Oh, uh, okay. is this what I think it is? Hola, my housewarming gift is a little late, but enjoy, enjoy the, the ride. ride. Oh. Enjoy the ride. Uh oh. That's cool. Oh, it has wheels and everything. What? It's a skateboard. Hang on a sec. And it's got a carrying thing on it? What does it say? It says... Thought you should... Thought you should cruise Europe in style, Aww. like a rock... I've never seen a board oh, with a... Cool. I've never seen a board with a strap. It's a skateboard purse. It's a... Well, it's a supposedly this is also functional, so let's... Let's give it a look-see. Okay. I'm yeah. so interested. I have to get some grip tape here. Oh, oh it's got grip tape. Oh, wow, look at that. Oh, that's cool. I've, I'm wow, that's fancy. super impressed. I've never seen anything like this. A board with like a leather strap over the wow. grip tape. Wow. But here's, here's what I'm really excited about. I have not seen this. Oh, oh yes! Oh my gosh, that's so cool. That's kind of wicked. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. This, this is it's ridiculously right on the wood too. Cool. It's not a sticker or anything. Oh man, that is cool. Yeah, maybe we will have to get uh, bring back. Uh, I think we should Ollie hang it Kid up at the end. Yeah, you know what? That would look really good right there. Right? You know Wouldn't that saying? look cool? I think it would. Wow. Look cool. Okay, this is probably just about the most rad gift from a fan we've ever received. So everybody should go and check out by Andreas, <laughs> by Andreas on Twitter I still and love com. Monkey though. Um, Dude, look at the wheels on this thing. Can I try oh, it? Yeah, here. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's totally OSHA, too. Yeah, well, of course it is. Ooh, nice and smooth, especially on this carpet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe at the end of the show, we'll get you doing a kickflip. Oh, yeah, like I can do one of those. Okay, well, we'll try. I used to be able to in high school. This is, this is seriously rad. I've never seen anything so... Meticulous as far as skateboarding <laughs> is concerned. I mean, look at the leather on. Anyway, whatever. Okay, um, getting totally sidetracked here. Mm. Uh, we should probably get into some uh, LED goodness. Some actual show I, content. You know, here's actually here's the thing. This is all about the gear. I don't know if you guys know this, but one of the reasons why we started Hack Five is because we needed an excuse to buy fancy camera equipment. Because <laughs> we have this thing called Techno Lust, and it drives us to want cool things like electric skateboards and cameras and drones <laughs> and fun things of that nature. So, 
Yes. We got a really good video yes, we sent did. to us by this guy named uh, Aussie Klutz. And he basically said, hey, I wanted to explain to you guys why you're not changing the voltage on an LED. You're actually changing it, the pulse width modulation to make it actually pulse whenever you're, you have a LED that's fading from like on to off. Yeah, I felt so embarrassed when I said that. I knew the moment it <laughs> came I out of my mouth that it, I was so saying like... it wrong, but I'm like, I don't know what the esotericness <laughs> of an LED fading What's is. What's the thing called again? It's not changing the amperage. It's not changing <laughs> voltage either. It turns out, in a way, it's kind of changing the voltage from on and off. Uh? On and off, but it just depends on the speed. Mm -hmm. of the photons. All right, walk so, me through it. Okay, so so we sent this crazy handy video. We basically explained the positive and negative charges that, and how they apply to light emitting diodes or LEDs and why when you're fading an LED, you're not changing the voltage, but the duty cycle of the phot photons with pulse width modulation. So the part of the LED that creates light is called a semiconductor and that's the itty bitty little metal part that's inside of an LED. And this is inside of the casing, so it's you can see it if you have a clear casing. Uh, you have to give the LED enough voltage to rid this, rid this little semiconductor of this little area that's in the very middle of it, and it's called a depletion region. It sounds weird. That's way more than I read <laughs> when I was getting into the theory, for real? Okay, yeah, so, <laughs> so he, he explained it really well, but I'm just gonna kind of grease over it. So this little depletion region, it acts as sort of an inductor or an insulator uh, for the middle of the semiconductor. What you need to do when you're giving your LED power with that voltage, you want to basically make that uh, depletion area disappear. So the more voltage you give it, the more those positive side of um, those positive charged electrons are going to push towards the, the middle and the more the negative ones are going to push towards the middle too. And once you get all of your positive ones and all of your negative ones pushing towards the middle fast enough, it makes that depletion range disappear and then your LED lights up. <laughs> wow, okay, but as far as my fading. terrible explanation. But as far as fading <laughs> it is concerned, it's not actually just varying the voltage. We're no, actually it's not. using a little bit of human trickery here, we isn't are. it? So we this talked about is... pulse width modulation, in fact, in a weird sense when we, we talked, talked about... about signal theory. Yes, signal theory, right. right. When we, we were doing antennas. Things like time division, multiplexing, pulse amplitude modulation, yeah. things of that nature. And really, it's just we, this is when we had the whole discussion about hertz, right? And then I started punching you once per second, and that's <laughs> yes. a hert, right? <laughs> so this uses hertz too, which is right. Interesting, interesting enough. So it changes the speed of the photons in the LED. So pulse width modulation that happens several, several times a minute. Um, it can happen tens of thousands if you need it to go fast enough. So for example, a little light dimmer that you would have in your household, you know, mm -hmm. to just dim your lights that you have up in your ceiling. That might change at 120 hertz. I found that number off of Wikipedia. So it, it has a pretty fast speed, but other things can get up into the tens of thousands hertz, and that's basically a waveform that shows the speed of the change from on to off. You're never going to go in the middle, basically. You're you're always yeah, going to be like changing binary. from there's on to off. Yeah, it's binary. There's ones and zeros. Yeah, it's right? always ones and there's zeros. There's no 0.5. No, there's not. So pulse pulse width modulation is measured in duty cycles, and duty cycle is going to tell you how many times it goes from on to off or off to on. Uh, this can be anywhere between 100% duty cycle, which means which the LED would be on 100% right? on, of the time, all the way to 0%, which would mean that it's all, all the time off. So that this would be like 50% duty cycle if I'm doing that, yeah. right? Where it's like half the time it's on and half the time it's off. Yeah, exactly. And if you do it like where you're, you're off most of the time, but you're mm -hmm. on for like a split second, it could be like you know, 20% duty cycle or whatever it might be. Right, and the cool thing about the Arduino stuff is they actually take care of a lot of this. They come up with like values like brightness to kind of like break it down to like a human form uh, with very values between zero and 255 yeah. so that you don't have to think about what it's actually doing. So speaking of that. And while you um, do that, I'm gonna grab the thing to show <laughs> us an example. So basically you have a couple of different examples with the code that I showed about two weeks ago. If you have an LED that's at 255 brightness, that's the biggest 8-bit number that you can get. 255 would be on pretty much all the time. That's the highest brightness that you can get. It would be 
on, so it means that it's 100% of the photons per second that it can actually light up or release from the LED. So that means it would be 100% duty cycle. Now, if you have an LED that's on zero brightness in your code or off, then it'll be 0% of the time. Zero photons will be given off from the LED, so it's 0% duty cycle. So if I started my LED at 128, which is about half, that would be 50% of the time, 50% duty cycle. And then there's a lot of really complicated math involved in there, but I'd just say look that up because I don't but even want to deal with that. It's still really cool. In fact, I've got an example here, and we'll be talking about this a little bit later on when we get into the drone goodness. So you can't uh, see it with your eyes, but no, it's, you, it's changing No, this shows up on the camera. You can see, so what this is doing is it's fading in and out. You, know, you can totally see that on camera, and I'll just set this down here for you, Paul. But... Um, this but the pulse width modulation is fast enough that you're not going to see it go back to off any of that time while it's fading from zero all the way to 100%. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you know what's interesting, the reason that that works is, um, and this comes to like a totally different discipline, and you can see how they're all totally intermingled. Something that Paul is keen on when it comes to the video things, and that is uh, a theory that is persistence of vision. And it's the reason why we have things ah. like 20, a frame rate of 24 frames per second in film, or 30 frames per second on television if you're here in North America, or maybe 25 frames per second if you're in Europe. Um, it's also the same reason why CRT monitors, you remember those old big things mm -hmm. we would lug to land parties? I think my mom um, still has one of those. <laughs> For real? I think so. Wow. It, it might be in the attic now. We, we got a hookup on a free e-cycling place. But anyway, uh, <laughs> 75 hertz was your typical. But even some people could see like a 75 hertz like, refresh rate yeah. on a monitor the way that they would uh, display this, especially if it's interlaced. And, um, and that's why like the higher the refresh rate is usually like smoother. That's why you see TVs now touting 60 hertz, 120 hertz, 240 hertz. So the higher your hertz, the less you're going to see that difference in the pulse width modulation. Right. I mean, the, the theory is that for moving images that the human brain will be tricked or, uh, you know, the, the flicker fusion threshold, as it's called, <laughs> is something like 16 frames per second. Now, huh. that does not mean we're about to start uploading Hack 5 videos at 16 FPS because you will all get sick. Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, it comes into like a lot of different things, like fluorescent lights, how yeah. they, they um, I don't know what the frequency is of those. Maybe it is 120 hertz, but I guess different... Uh, different, you know, light fixtures, different, you know, disciplines yeah. like, you know, videography and light and all of these other things rely on this exact uh, technique that you're talking about, pulse width modulation. And even different species, like pigeons, I guess, uh, supposedly see, have like a higher uh, persistence of vision or a higher That's flicker really cool. fusion threshold than humans. This is one of those, it's, it's easy to understand once you see some examples like the fading LED, but mm -hmm. it's it's surprising that this is used all over the world for all sorts of different things. Yeah, like once something... you understand it, you're like, oh, there's some pulse with modulation going on there. There's something beautiful about that. And you know what I love is, yes, it is fantastic that Arduino does, you know, breaks it down for you so that you can quite simply do which is like the abstracted human layer of, I want the brightness of my LED to be 50% yeah. or 128 if it's between 0 and 255. And that's a fantastic thing, but there's But I'm really great. happy that Aussie Klutz was like, hey, 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 <laughs> let me explain this for you. <laughs> yeah, let's and break it down. I was like, oh, that makes so much sense once you break it down like that. And the thing that I love about that always is it's no longer magic. You no, know? it's not. Yes. I'm, I, I, I'm no longer looking at my code and being like, oh, well, 255 means it's on. Now I'm like, well, that means it's a 100% duty cycle. <laughs> like, although, I get that. <laughs> although I will say in technology, there is such a thing as uh, voodoo magic. Because <laughs> the other day yes. I, was, I was working on a, a transmitter a, for a RC system, and I, for some reason, couldn't get the ailerons to go below zero. I could get to 1,000, but not negative 1,000. Played with it all night, left it picked it up the next day, and everything just magically worked. That is so, so weird. You all know. You know. So <laughs> let's not myth bust quite yet. There are spooky spirits within the machines, and they are that magic smoke that we shall not let out. Uh, but thank Ghost you much machine, for <laughs> thank you much for sending in the explanation, and I love just kind of geeking out about that stuff. Yeah, I do too. Know, it's pulsing it's LED really could cool. Be so cool. And it's so much easier to understand when somebody is like drawing it out for you as opposed to just reading it on Wikipedia. I don't understand that stuff half the time I read it. Ugh. 
Just keep reading it until you do. Ugh. And then click all the links and read all the articles in there. <laughs> and then next uh -huh. thing you know, you're Steve like, Harris. wow, humpback whales. What? <laughs> I, you know, you just keep clicking on Wikipedia. I don't, where, where do you end up? Let us know. Feedback at no, hack5.org. <laughs> There's some good stuff there. This could be really and, bad. <laughs> Yeah, let us know in the comments below your favorite uh, Time Suck Wikipedia article. <laughs> Maybe it leads to Kevin Bacon, I don't know. Uh, and with that, we're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, I'm droning on about drones. See what, see what it did there? It doesn't matter if you're into pulse width modulation or pulse amplitude modulation, or you don't like to modulate at all, it doesn't matter, because Domain.com, they don't discriminate. They just find you the website, they get you the domain name that you want really quickly. They've got a domain discovery system that makes it too, super simple, and their checkout process is like no BS. You're like, boom, website up and running, no time. And that's why I keep telling you guys, because I'm a huge fan of theirs, because they just, they've got reliable service, they're easy to use, they're a fun place to do business. You can tweet them at Domain.com and see what I'm talking about. Those guys are kind of rad, they're huge fans of Hack5, so they want to hook you up to put together a special coupon code that you can use to take 15% off your next order at domain.com. That coupon code, of course, is H-A-K-5. That spells hack5. They'll get you 15% off at domain.com. So when you think domain names, think domain.com. It is now time for the trivia question of the week. So last week's trivia question was, to whom was the first patent for a technical invention awarded? And the answer is Filippo Brunelleschi. I hope I said that right. If I didn't, don't correct me in the emails. <laughs> he was an architect and an engineer from 1421. He devised a barge with a hoist to be used for bringing marble blocks up the river from Arno to Florence for the quarries at Carrera. And he was the first one that actually got awarded a patent for that. Now this week's trivia question is, how many of the first Apple computers were built? And you can answer that over at hak5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 goodies. 65,536. Shh. When it comes to the gear, I guess you could say I have the techno lust. I think I was saying earlier that it's one of actually the determining factors of why we even started the show, because we like to play with the equipment, and Paul will attest to that. So I get a lot of questions about you know, quadcopters, UAVs, drones. We've done some series before on building them with open source flight controllers and cool stuff like that, and they're rather large, but Considering that we are going on a, or you will be joining me on a trip that I love to dub Hack Across Europe every couple of Februarys, we like to do this, I am super excited to be bringing with me one of my fun new hobbies, which is the droning or the you know model aircraft or the RC helicopters or the, whatever you want to call them, quadcopters, right? And I get this question so much, so I thought I would just spend this segment, instead of going into like SSH tunnels and things of that nature, I thought I would answer a constant question that I get, which is, you know, what are you packing as far as your quadcopter or your drone? And I want to show you guys something special that I put together because I just love the, the, um, the, okay, so another way to put it is, if I ask you what is your best camera right now, or what is your best camera when you're traveling, and, and the answer may be that uh, you, know, you have a nice little DSLR somewhere on the shelf, but chances are when you're out and about traveling, you don't have a giant DSLR in your pocket. What you do have is your phone, and that's why a lot of times your phone is your best camera. And so in that, I've kind of made some trade-offs and come up with, I guess what you could say is the netbook of FPV quadcopters in that it is the go everywhere, do most things pretty well kind of system. And I guess I'm, uh, I'm excited to show you two things, actually, just not just that, but also this is our new, um, our new tactical elite kit that's part of the Wi-Fi Pineapple stuff. It's, uh, it's new in the hack shop. Uh, I've been rocking this for quite a while, and this will be my only tech bag in uh, Hack Across Europe. So I'm excited to basically be living out of this thing here. And you know, it's, it's large enough for like mentioning the netbooks, uh, you know, carrying the netbooks and whatnot. But I wanna show you this kit that I've put together because I'm kind of proud of it in that basically everything is compartmentalized into a few couple of different uh, cases here. So that right there is it. I'm gonna put the bag down now. This is my entire flight system. And so within the RC world, there is a lot of discussion about your 
AUW, or your all up weight. And that, what that means is, it means the weight of your craft when it is fully loaded and actually flying. So you may have a quadcopter, but you also have the battery that goes in it and powers it. And you may also have the camera systems that are on it and the video transmission systems and all of the components that go into that. And I find that that's really interesting that there's a lot of emphasis within this community on you know the weight and size of your craft when it's all flying, but a lot doesn't go into the entire ground station. Everything that is on your head, in your hands, and back home to recharge. So your, your goggles, your video receivers, your uh, transmitter, and your uh, battery rechargers, uh, I all take into the equation. And I don't know what the right term is for this all, all up weight, but for me, as I'm about to go backpacking, it's really about being able to take everything that I love with me so that I can like hopefully capture some beautiful shots of, I don't know, the Rhine River or, or whatever have you uh, on, on these trips. And you know, there's something so surreal about the perspective from the sky and being able to put on a pair of goggles and feel like a bird. So I kind of want to take that with me as I travel. And so for that, I want to show you a system that I've put together that uh, I've been playing, I've been tinkering with this for the last year. I've never really talked about this on Hack5. I'm not sure how much of this applies to Hack5, but if we want to get into more of this uh, later on, we can do a whole series or even spin off some other stuff. But basically, this is the kit. So this, uh, this right here contains the entire system. So I have my quadcopter, I'll come back to that in a second, as well as the batteries, even more batteries, my video system and the antenna for it and the transmitter. I have my battery chargers and my uh, cameras for actually capturing the HD stuff. And so I'll just go over some of the things that I like to bring with me. This is a Mobius camera and it's got a nice wide angle lens. This guy here takes a uh, video that's 1080p and kind of akin to maybe a Hero uh, uh, GoPro Hero 2 kind of esque quality, still pretty good. This is an 808 number 16 camera. It kind of looks like a key fob and has what they call the D lens on it. This lens right here is 120 degree field of view diagonally and it takes 720p video. That's quite acceptable. It's also ridiculously lightweight and with a little bit of Velcro kind of goes everywhere. Uh, otherwise, the rest of the system is, I've got a video transmitter here that's a 600 TVL Fat Shark camera, and it's actually just zip tied onto a 250 milliwatt 5.8 gigahertz video transmitter. And the reason for that is just that it's so light and it provides really good video quality. Um, and that's, that's all there is to it. That and a cloverleaf antenna. And we can go into like antenna design in another show, but essentially this provides the best kind of all around experience. And what this does is it gets just Velcroed on top of the quadcopter here, and then the flight cameras to actually record the nice HD video gets Velcroed onto the bottom. So the quadcopter is really where it's all about. So this right here is a modified RC Logger i1 Extreme. And as you can see, what's pretty sick and modified about it is this carbon fiber folding frame. So typically it's a the plastic quadcopter, and it's actually one that I highly recommend after you've learned on something like an inexpensive $40 toy like the Hubsan X4, which is a great beginner one. Once you've graduated from that and you actually want to take the next step that leads into the much more expensive and, and kind of ridiculous fun RC world, uh, the i1 Extreme by RC Logger does a great job of bridging that gap in that it actually provides something that will be that can be used with a typical you know, big flight uh, uh, transmitter like a Spectrum or a Futaba or some of those others that we talked about with Peter Estin before when we did our drone series. It's cool because you're not limited to just being, you know, using some little toy transmitter, which is kind of fantastic. It also has a huge community behind it. And as such, uh, this carbon fiber frame has been designed specifically for it by the guys over at Phoenix Flight Gear. And I've got to give props over to those guys and uh, Tony over at rcdrones.com and the guys that put this together because it is really a sick setup. I've had, uh, this is probably my second, yeah, this is my second. I've had their first gen of this and this is my second. And what I love so much about it is the RC Logger I1 Extreme, it's really unique in that it is a brushless system. So these motors here are brushless. They, that's really fantastic. Uh, and it's got a single, 
uh, PC board that does the electronic speed controlling. It does the uh, transmission, and uh, you know it does the the uh, you know the receiver for the controller, and it does the flight controller. And it's just a basic flight controller. It's got your accelerometer, accelerometers, your gyroscopes, and your barometers. It doesn't have GPS, so this is very much a manual craft in that sense, right? But it is super stable, and it's just one PC board, so there's not just a ton of stuff going everywhere. As you can see, it's just that one board and a couple of wires going to these uh, motors. And these are upgraded T motors with some carbon fiber props here. So the whole system basically starts out as like a $100 plastic a toy from RC Logger. And then uh, the, the frame I think is like 70 or something like that. But you know, you can just keep adding on. But what I get out of this is something that I can, you know, take one of these batteries, plug it in here, and then I can pop on my video transmitter and as I showed you, this just fits in this tiny little, what looks like a CD case, you know, if you remember what those are. And, and there we go. You know, I can, I can go ahead and fly this. I can actually now take my video transmitter and just plug that in here and just Velcro this onto the top. And that's just tapping into the, uh, the battery lines here. And what's kind of innovative about the RC Logger system that I haven't seen in any of the other stuff, don't get me wrong, I love the open source ones like the, the Naze and I love the Multi-Wii and I love the CC3Ds and there's a bunch of other flight controllers that are kind of rad except they don't uh, do the entire system on one chip, which means that you've got a bunch of other components, which means a lot of extra weight. And more specifically, they don't do something really innovative and that is, uh, these battery systems. So this is just something that I, I hugely geek out about uh, and this is basically the reason why I'm choosing this system. Because when I talk about the all up weight, things like your transmitter and maybe your video goggles, those aren't going to change much. But what you can really save a lot of weight on is your battery system considering the fact that typically you have to bring a LiPo charger which is a big piece of equipment with a giant battery, with a, with a giant like wall brick and um, they're not convenient What's really cool about these batteries is they actually, this is the charger. This is just a USB dongle. And what I think is so cool about this is this is not a, while this, while the, while this quadcopter runs at, I guess you could say two cell or, um, or 8.4 volts, these are actually two single cell batteries bonded together and that's why it's able to be charged by just a regular USB 5 volt charger. That's because these are two 3.7 volts, right? So they, they kind of merge when you get them into the quadcopter but what it means is ridiculous space savings in that this is all I need to bring instead of a giant piece of equipment. Uh, so that just basically allows me to, between the carbon fiber and the folding uh, and the uh, innovative batteries, it really allows me to bring together a, a system anywhere just in this small little guy. Uh, of course, the rest of the gear that I'm bringing along are a pair of uh, Fat Shark goggles. These are pretty standard throughout. These are, I think, the Dominator V2s. They've got a built-in uh, DVR, so it'll actually go ahead and record onto an SD card in there. Same antenna, same polarization, so it's right-hand circular, rejects a lot of multipathing interference, and you end up looking kind of uh, badass, I think. I don't know, maybe not. But they get the job done pretty well. They're pretty small. And then the last bit of kit, and this is actually where I'm doing uh, a lot of research right now, is the transmitter. And so this is the stock transmitter that comes with the RC Logger. And you may look at it and laugh and say, that's a toy, it looks like a PlayStation remote. And you're absolutely right. It is, it feels like a PlayStation remote, but it fits inside of a little GoPro case with a couple of spare batteries and extra parts, and that means it goes everywhere. I will say, however, and this is something that we're probably going to follow up on, there are some tiny controllers that also accept open source firmware that can be modded to extend their range and other good stuff like that. So expect me to be talking about some things in that nature uh, coming up. If this is something of interest, I know I'm just geeking out about gear right now and that's not typical on Hack5, but I am super stoked because it is what I've been working on uh, for the last couple of weeks as I get ready for uh, this trip and I really want to you know, capture some cool area of aerial videography and you know, I want to feel like a bird wherever I go. So. Um, let me know what you guys think because this is something that I've 
totally gotten into. And if you've been following my video blogs, you'll see that I've got a lot of stuff on there about flying. Um, and I want to do this in, in a way that we can bring it into Hack 5. We can maybe teach builds and responsible flying and things of that nature. Um, so, yeah, with that, I'm going to go ahead and drone on. Uh, but you guys let me know what you think in the comments. And I'll catch you guys later. Okay. Full control. Patrick Norton here, Shannon's partner on Tech Thing. Wondering what's coming up this week? It's awesome. The perfect PC toolkit, three mail apps to make iOS better, Raspberry Pi Model 2, and a little help unlocking your phone. So come check it out at techthing.com. Back to you guys. That just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack 5. That's the name of the show, but I can't pronounce it because it's only been 10 years. I probably shouldn't do this, huh? Hey, hey. Sorry. That's our, I was going to put my name in it. Our new table is a cutting board. Don't hey, guess, cut on it. Guess what I did this what? past weekend. We're going to go with this take? I I went to a gun range. Oh, what'd you shoot? Um, an AR-15, I think. <laughs> with all the Call of Duty you I played, you don't know pictures. what an AR-15 is? I pictures. I don't know. Oh, it, was, uh, it, was, um, it was totally created by Robert Heron, so he completely modded this thing to his specs. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I spent a lot of money, but it's great. And then, and so I shot one of those, and then I tried a couple of pistols. And I was like, this is really cool. I thought it was awesome to just go to a gun range and understand the safety of using the gun and the proper etiquette to use it at a gun range. There's a lot of rules involved whenever you go to one you of know, those places. That's, so that's another, it was we're, really cool. We we're just talking about PWM and the A block and how like the different disciplines that that applies to. And it's like, it seems like whether it's tele or not telecommunications, but like, you know, ham radio operations, something that we're both keen on right now, yeah. uh, or drones or shooting or even hacking. There's yeah. like definitely a, there's like the rules. There's the, yeah. you know, there the are, etiquette. There's proper right? rules. There's the proper way to do it. I love that. I do too. And yes. I, I'm glad that my first time actually going out and shooting guns involved going with an actual instructor and learning everything from, you know, how to just flip the safety switch to how to actually load it and set it down. So you weren't just fashion. like holding the AR by your waist no, and spinning around pointing not. at people? I wasn't even allowed to pick it up off the table pretty much. They were like, you set it on the table and when you're done and your okay. little thing is empty, you set it down. All I'm going to say, Shan, is next time, B-roll. B-roll? Okay. Yeah, everybody wants to see <laughs> I you. I might have gotten everybody some wants video. Everybody with, with some check. recoil. I might action. have gotten some video. Yes, good stuff. <laughs> cool. Um, that that definitely is a techno lust tickler. Uh, yeah. If you're into guns, let Shannon know, uh, or or all of us here at Hack5. Feedback at hack5.org is the way that you can get a hold of us, or you can just drop a comment below. And with that, I'm very excited to also announce that by the time you're watching this, Hack Across Europe is among us. So if you are, again, in the European economic area, I'm not really sure what you guys call that, the Eurozone. Uh, come on out, because, you know, everybody's neighbor's there. It's like he can walk from Aww. Luxembourg to Brussels. That's awesome. Whatever. It's totally cute. That's I can't really wait to cool. meet you all. It's going to be rad. Oh, right? man, I wish I was Especially going. Especially if you fly FPV, let's get down, huh? Can I go to one of these things? Because this sounds really fun. It is. Ugh. Okay, that was not an invite, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Email us feedback at hack5.org. Well, what do you want to hack across? Also... Aren't you hacking across the I wanna, Caribbean? I want to hack, <laughs> pretty much. I want to hack across Asia. Okay. I want to go to Japan, Korea, and China. Okay. And maybe some other places along the way, too. So if you are willing to host a snubs and you're in Asia, uh, hit us up, feedback at hack 5 Especially if you're a girl. Org. And, uh, and with the, oh, see, now I just want to see, like, B-roll of you in one of those kitten cafes. Oh, my gosh, the kitten cafes. This is, this is, has to happen. Let's make this happen. Okay. You just broke me. All right, with that, I'm Darren Kitchen. Oh, she had more. She's <laughs> broken. Trust your techno lust. Kitties. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. Let's do that again. <laughs> I wasn't ready. Okay. <laughs> give, me, give, me, give me your best. Meow meow. There you go. That's signature snubs meow. All right. Let's skate. Whoa, these trucks are loose. <laughs> Not in the mood to break my head. Whoop!